Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, why do we pray? As we're studying the Lord's Prayer together over the course of these weeks, uh, that's kind of the question that, that kind of sits in the, the back of the room silently, waiting for us to approach it. Why are we doing all of this in the first place? What's the point? What is it that we're hoping to, to accomplish? To see, to hear, to experience, to, to, to do, to create. What is it that we're doing? Why are we praying in the first place? When we pray these words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is it that we are hoping will happen in our lives? This morning I read from the Gospel of Luke, a little bit different than Matthew, which we're used to hearing from, and this passage is shorter, simply three words, thy kingdom come. But man, oh man, some powerful three words. When we hear those words, when we pray those words, what is it that we are doing? What is it that we are hoping for? I would suggest a couple, three things with a couple, three metaphors about the ways that we pray, especially in the case of these three powerful words. First metaphor that I would use is the metaphor of the mirror. When we look in a mirror, most likely, we're wanting to do something. We're wanting to, to see ourselves, to fix our hair, to put on our makeup, to check if we have anything in our teeth. We do something because we want to see our reflection. Now, some of us look in the mirror maybe once a day, hopefully at least once a day. Some of us look in the mirror maybe a little bit more often than that. And as we look, we're, we're looking to see what is it that, that I have in my body, in my uh, closeness here that I want to assess. It's the same that we pray. We look at ourselves and we say, well, what's going on in my life that I want to pray about? Man, my, my foot hurts. Man, uh, I've, I've got some, some, some bad stuff happening in my family. I, I have things in my own person that I want to look at and reflect. It's like uh, uh, the, the passage, I'm going to uh, steal your bulletin here from uh, uh, the quote from uh, Kathleen Norris. Prayer is not asking for what you think you want, but asking to be changed in ways you can't imagine. Just like the Apostle Paul says, we don't look in the mirror without wanting to do something about it. We don't just walk in the, look in the mirror and walk away from it. We want to, to look in the mirror and say, how will I be changed? During Lent, we're focusing on that reflection. This is one of those fancy mirrors that has two sides. One is a, a normal mirror and the other is more magnified. This is what we do during Lent. We flip it around and look at the magnified side. Look deep in our lives and say, God, how would you change me? What is it in my life that is broken? What is it in my life that is hurting? What is it in my life, in the way that I live, in the way that I treat people, in the way that I listen for you, that needs some reflection? And we engage in the hope that God will change us. Last week I used the metaphor of the, the blacksmith who has hope that, that this big, big slab of metal can turn into something beautiful. But it takes work. It takes work. It takes a lot of heating and cooling and, and fixing and bending. In the same way, it takes us looking pretty deeply, sometimes uncomfortably, into the magnified mirror of our souls. That's why Lent takes 40 days, a good 10% of the year, to do this process 
of deeply searching who we are. And so, one of the answers to that prayer, why do we pray, or that question, why do we pray, is to reflect upon who it is that we are. But that's not the end of the story. It, it actually cannot be. Perhaps you know the, the story of uh, um, the Greek Narcissus. Narcissus was an incredibly beautiful man. The gods created him to be beautiful, but they also created him to, to be unaware of what he looked like. And so when people walked by and saw him, they were amazed at this incredibly handsome man. But he had no idea. Until one day he stopped by a pool and saw his reflection in that pool. And as he saw that reflection, he said, Who is this incredibly handsome creature that I see before me? And he stopped and he paused and he sat down and he looked into the pool. For several minutes, for several hours, for several days, he didn't ever leave the pool. He kept staring at that reflection, wondering how, how anybody could be so handsome. Until he fell in and drowned and died because he didn't stop focusing on the reflection. A story that is helpful for us as well. There comes a time when we need to stop navel-gazing and begin to look beyond ourselves. It's kind of like when you look in a mirror. Sometimes you'll look behind yourself. You know, you'll see somebody else come in the room or you'll, you'll see a, uh, a pile of laundry that you forgot was there. Or you'll see a spot on the wall that uh, uh, you, you thought you had painted over. And, and you start to see the world around you a little bit more and you, you're your arm gets a little longer and you start to look around at more than just yourself, more than just your reflection, you start to see a bigger world. N.T. Wright suggests an answer to that question of why do we pray is twofold. One, because we know there is a bigger world out there. And two, because we know there is a bigger God out there. And so we begin to ask questions about that bigger world. We begin to pray for folks outside of our own community. We begin to, to pray for people around the world. We begin to pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for injustice in our own community. And as we look, all of a sudden, we've changed metaphors. And we've moved from the mirror to the binoculars. Now, I'll admit, I completely stole this metaphor from N.T. Wright. The idea of the binoculars as prayer. He talks about this idea that, that prayer must be about a binocular vision. Now, it's ironic that the, the, the mirror is kind of the starting point. Inside of these binoculars, there, there are prisms. There are mirrors that reflect each other so that uh, the, the image will be changed. And so when I look in it, one image comes here, but by the time it reaches my eye, it looks different. It looks bigger. It looks magnified. And so the idea of the binocular vision of prayer, as N.T. Wright suggests, is that when we pray, thy kingdom come. We are praying for a new vision, a new understanding of the world around us. When we pray those words, thy kingdom come, what it assumes, even though we don't say it aloud, is that my kingdom goes that I set aside my vision and the way that I look at the world for a, a different vision, God's vision. Of course, we cannot know completely what God's vision is, but we pray that prayer so that we might know a little more. Now, binocular vision doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a set of binoculars. Binocular vision just means uh, with two eyes. Uh, binocular vision is what gives us depth perception. You know, if you walk around with just one eye, you see things a lot flatter, especially if it's your bad eye, you start to run into things. If you have both eyes, your vision is clearer. It's better. And so N.T. Wright suggests that we need this binocular vision in the way that we look at the world. He suggests looking with two eyes at once. The first eye is the eye that looks and sees God's creation as good. As God said it was, as beautiful as creative, as powerful, as amazing. How many of us look and see 
the sunrise, which is a little bit later than normal this morning, or see the, the sunset, or drive through the mountains and see God's handiwork. I love the work of DeWitt Jones, a photographer who has an ongoing uh, series of photography called Celebrate What's Right with the World. He said he was tired of the cynicism. He was tired of, of the apathy. And he said, I'm going to take pictures of things that are beautiful. And I'm going to share. I'm going to celebrate what's right with the world. And so he'll take a, a picture of a powerful volcano on Hawaii where he lives or a child or on a bicycle in the street. What's right with the world? That's one of our eyes. However, with the other one, we also see that there is something beyond beauty. We look with God's eyes and we grieve those in pain. We grieve that which is broken. We grieve that which is not what God intended. We ask questions like justice matters and that ministry did. We ask questions like you did at the house meetings. What keeps you up at night? What makes you angry? What is it that is not right? What is it that God grieves in this world? And we look around and we see those in pain. And we know that when we look through both lenses at once, we see both the hope and the promise and the pain and the grief that perhaps God sees as well. And we pray with humility and a desire for understanding. Thy kingdom come. It's John Dominic Crossan who talks about this idea of kingdom. He said when the disciples asked to teach us to pray, they had a very clear understanding of what kingdom was going to be. And when Jesus taught them, he had a very different understanding of what that was going to be. In fact, what what most of them probably assumed was that the kingdom that Jesus came to tell them about was coming, was imminent. There will be a kingdom one day, they imagined. And probably this guy's going to bring it. It's going to have a different government. It's going to have some armies. It's going to have a, a sense of control about what's right and what's wrong. There's going to be a kingdom like we know a kingdom ought to be. And then Jesus began to teach them about a kingdom that's like a, a mustard seed. So small, almost unnoticeable, but powerful. About a kingdom that's like a, an annoying woman that keeps knocking on the door of the judge's house because she is so committed to what she believes. About a kingdom that's like a, a foreigner an ungodly and undocumented Samaritan who becomes the hero of the story, who reaches down and picks up the broken man when the good church people just walk by. Crossan tells us that when Jesus told them about that kingdom, he didn't say it's coming, he said it's here. He didn't say the kingdom is near. He said the kingdom is here. He didn't say it, it, is, it is imminent. He said it is present. That when we look around, there are examples of that kingdom right here and right now. But of course, that's one lens. Through the other lens, we find ways that it's still not here. The already and not yet of the Apostle Paul. And so we look with a new vision. We look hoping that God will open our eyes, understanding when we pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, that we are hoping not only to reflect upon our own lives, but upon a new way to see all of it. And then there's one final metaphor. Now, both of these have used glass in very different ways. A simple mirror to reflect one's image, a set of binoculars with a lot of different pieces of glass. This last element has glass in it for a very different reason. 
I hold my old scout compass that has glass covering uh, a magnet that tells us which way It's broken, I think. <laughs> Which way is north? <laughs> and as we use a compass, how many of us just look at it and say, well, that's nice, and put it away and go about our business? That's not why we use a compass. We use a compass because when we look at it, we want to act. We want to do something. We want to go somewhere. We want to go in the right direction. If we're headed the right direction that we know is the right way, then we're not going to stop and look at a compass. We use a compass when we want to know what do we do next. And so when we pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, we're reflecting. We're looking for a new vision. And we're looking for a way to act. For God to lead us, to teach us, to move us, to Tell us how to respond. We don't just say, thy kingdom come, and then put our hands in our pockets and sit back down. Again, Jesus taught the complete opposite. So many of the disciples would have thought that Jesus was talking about a kingdom that God would bring on earth, that God was going to come, that their, their posture needed to be one of sitting and waiting because God was going to come do all of it. There was actually a group of faithful believers that did this. They were called the Essenes. And they said, well, God is coming back, and so the, the safest thing to do is get out of the way when the judgment comes. So they went out to the desert, out to the caves, and they waited. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And know what didn't happen? Jesus didn't join them. Jesus did not adopt the posture of waiting. He opened up the compass and he prayed, Thy kingdom come and said, Where do I go next? And so Crossan tells us once again in powerful words, You have been waiting for God. Meanwhile, God has been waiting for you. God has been inviting us to participate, to act, to do the work. And when we pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, N.T. Wright says it's a reflection and a commissioning. Not only is it a, a way to submit, but it is a way to commission, just like we commissioned the group of folks today. When we pray that prayer, if we just say it and ignore the words, we're missing the point. If you pray the prayer and you mean it, get ready to work. Get ready to open up the compass and say, where to next? Why do we pray? Why do we say those words every week? Why do we close our eyes? Why do we teach our children to say them? Because when we do, we are being changed. It's an opportunity for reflection, an opportunity for a new vision. It's an opportunity for action today. Let us gather around that hope that the kingdom is coming, that God's will will be done here, just like it's done in God's heaven. Let us pray. Lord, during this Lenten season, we pause to seek your face, to ask in simple yet profound ways, how would you move us? God, we pray as we look at the world around us and we see both the joy and the pain, we see both the humor and the hubris, that you are the God of it all. And you are leading us to bring about your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.